Kamaka, what's uh, what's the last couple of months been like? Uh, probably haven't spent that much time in Alaska, and I'm sure you're missing missing basketball. Uh, it's 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 been really tough, actually. Uh, the gyms up here have been closed pretty much the whole time. It actually just reopened uh, this past week at a 25% capacity. So basically, we have to like call and make reservations for an uh, an hour slot. But it's it's been really good just to be able to shoot a basketball again. I mean, prior to that, I was uh, the only thing I was able to do is strength and conditioning workouts. So as far as basketball goes, it's definitely something that I miss doing and and something that I'm not going to take for granted ever again just because of the situation we're in now. Uh, but other than that, I've been pretty good just trying to stay on top of school, just adjusting to that. Um, taking so many online classes is pretty difficult. Um, and then I've also just recently started a job. So that's something that I'm not used to, but it's it's definitely a good experience. Uh, uh, Roger, go ahead. Okay, sorry. The follow, we know what kind of student you are, Kamaka. What inspired you for the EMT training? Uh, well, actually, so – Kind of like the backstory behind that is like my grandfather, uh, he's originally from Montana, um, but he made his way up to Barrow, Alaska somehow. I want to say it was through the military. Uh, but when he first got to Barrow, um, or before he was working at Barrow, he was uh, working at a fire department in Fairbanks, Fairbanks, Alaska. And then so the people down there told him like they up here in Barrow, like they were in need of a fire department. So they sent him up here, and he was actually the first fire chief up in Barrow, Alaska, where I'm from. So it's just something that, that he would, would teach me as a little kid and would always talk about. So I just felt like it was right to at least get into it and, and, and uh, begin to learn about it. Hey, Kamaka, you can continue that. <clears throat> These guys didn't hear your LH interview, so you can kind of expand about what you're actually doing in, in your internship, where you're at, et cetera. Okay. So uh, basically how it works up here is like college students are uh, given the opportunity to sign up for a temporary uh, college intern position. And so basically what that is, is like for the course of the summer, they're, they're able to work uh, for the different departments in our local government. So basically what you do is you just sign up for that application and then they kind of place you depending on certain factors. Um, and that's kind of just how I got got into that. And I, I just had a lot of free time on my hands and I felt like I needed some kind of routine just to keep me going. And, and I felt like getting a job was the best way to do that. Brian Davis, you're up. And sir. then my fault, Kamaka, do you want to keep going? No, nah, no, nah, you're good. <laughs> Brian, go ahead. Kamaka, that, that's really interesting, man. Uh, you said you had a lot of free time. Uh, w w did you even consider staying here, uh, or or were you? Did you go back home? Did, like, how long were you? Did you come back to Austin and then go straight to Alaska, or how? Yeah. That so, uh, so basically, what happened with that is like when we got back from Kansas City after the Big Twelve tournament was canceled, they told us that were they were going to send us all home or allow us to do whatever we wanted for spring break, which at the time was only extended two weeks. So my initial plan was to go back home and visit family um, and then come back to Austin. But when we got back and then a couple of weeks after they continued to have meetings and stuff, they informed us that we were actually going to have to stay, stay home and weren't allowed back on campus. And because I was staying in a dorm, I, I didn't have any place to live in Austin for me to go back to. So that's kind of why I've been here most of the time. <clears throat> Brian, follow up. Uh, <laughs> just what's it, what's it like? I mean, it's home to you, uh, -huh. uh but to obviously all of us here, I mean, Alaska seems like a whole nother planet practically. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what's going on there and how would you describe, uh, just kind of the feelings about all this uh, mm -hmm. Corona craziness there? Uh, well, first off being home, it's just been, such a great experience to be back and doing things that I did as a child and growing up uh, and just being in like a small village, a small town like this, like I feel like it makes you appreciate certain things a little more and I'm very grateful for that. And it's also been good to see my family and my grandparents and whatnot because I don't really get to come home too often just because of uh, how far I am and, and what our schedule um, consists of. So it's really good to be back. Uh, 
right now it's there's snow on the ground right now and i want to say it's about 20 degrees probably zero degrees with windshield so it's it's very chilly um and during in the month of april they actually they actually have uh is when whaling season is in is in uh progress so they're kind of just finishing that up now i want to say in barrow specifically uh they've caught in 12 whales i believe but i haven't i personally haven't been able to go out there yet uh i want to i know they recently caught one um so i, I wanted to go out there and help but i've just been kind of busy with school and finals and whatnot so i haven't been able to do that but that's just kind of what's been going on here uh a lot of the time that i spend when i'm not like doing school or, or working out or whatever is i like to uh i've been going snowmobiling so riding around on snow machines uh, I've been doing a little bit of snowboarding too, so just trying to do things that that I did uh, as a child, really. Dustin McComas, you're up. Yeah, of going back home uh, and seeing your family again. Are you just like a guy that's in high demand when you go back? Is everybody just trying to kind of hog mm -hmm. you and get some time and to catch up, or, or what are those conversations in that? those rekindling of those relationships like that you're able to go back and spend some, some really extended time in Alaska for the first time in a long time. Uh, it's, it's definitely, uh, like people recognize me and whatnot when I come home and stuff, uh, just because of the opportunity that I've had to play college basketball. But I feel like because I grew up here and because it's such a tight knit community that people really just see me as one of them. So it's good. It's, it's more of like a, it's more of like a two way relationship thing instead of like them kind of wanting all my attention. It's more like they're kind of used to me and like they're used to me being around and they're just more kind of focused on like how I've been doing and stuff like that. So it's definitely been good um, to see everybody because like I said, like I don't really get to come home too often. Uh, so it's good, good to really rekindle those relationships. Follow Dustin. Yeah. And, and, the college basketball aspect, speaking of that, when you think back to the way last season ended, now that you've had some time to reflect on that, just what are your thoughts about the way you guys finished the season and just, you know, everything happened so fast with the Big 12 tournament being canceled and, and, and all that sort of stuff and you guys just being dispersed from campus basically right away. Mm -hmm. um, when you reflect back on the season, just what are your general thoughts about the way you guys finished it and, and I guess as it relates to the future of the program and for yourself, um, what are your kind of your thoughts there as well? Uh, I feel like the most important thing we did as a team was exactly that, just kind of sticking together as a team and understanding that, like, uh, throughout the season, like, we're going to have up, ups and downs. But if we continue to trust in each other and continue to trust our work ethic, that we can accomplish the goals that we wanted to. Um, and I feel like we did that, uh, especially towards the end of the season, especially when our kind of our backs were kind of against the wall with so many injuries that we had. Uh, so it's definitely something that we're going to reflect on or that we have been reflecting on um, through our Zoom meetings and whatnot is just kind of understanding that and learning from that experience. So I feel like that's that's something that we're definitely going to try to apply as we prepare for next season. <clears throat> Nick Moyle, I've got you up. I kind of wanted to, to go to go back a little bit um, to the morning of the Big 12 tournament. Uh, you guys are out there practicing. You know, the, they had already imposed the fan restrictions, but you guys are getting ready to play a game. All of a sudden, you're pulled off the court. I mean, what are you thinking? Are you, do you realize right there that the season's over and that kind of late, late season run that you guys made is kind of almost going to go for nothing. I mean, I guess what were your emotions like when all that was, was happening, when it was just thrust upon you that morning? Uh, well, for I know for me and my teammates especially, like, it was more of a feeling of shock. Uh, like, it didn't feel real at the time. Just because of the whole – like, all the circumstances that were happening, I feel like a lot of the stuff that's going on now just in general are unprecedented times. So we didn't really know how to react. I mean, like I said, it just it just kind of felt unreal, and and uh, honestly, it didn't kind of kick in until I was home, and and I was told that I was gonna be home for a long time, uh, that things started to feel real, and 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 that we had to start adjusting to this new life that we're in. Follow. 
Yeah, and like you said, obviously it's been tough for you to really get out and practice and play. I mean, is this the longest that you've ever gone without, you know, having a ball in your hands, being able to yeah. play? Yeah, I actually – I was telling my friends that, like, uh, when we when we were able just to get back into the gym and actually shoot on regulation rims, like I told them, like, two months or like a month and a half or however long it was, was probably the longest in my entire lifetime that I went without shooting a basketball. So it's it was definitely uh, um, I'm not gonna say a good experience, but it was just it was just I don't know it was tough. It was definitely tough, and it made me realize how much passion I have for the game and how much love I have for the game, and and to not take that for granted. Bob Ballou, I'm gonna unmute you. Bob, go ahead. Uh, yeah, does Shaka know you're snowboarding? Is he okay with that? <laughs> yeah. I I try to I try to uh, keep that away from him. Uh, I know I know he's probably not too fond of it, but he understands that I'm home. So, what did what did what did the end of last year tell you about the group of guys that was on the floor, and how difficult do you think it'll be now with 13 guys probably that can play extended minutes um, mm -hmm. to really find who you guys are going to be next year? Uh, I feel like that, like what what kind of happened towards the end of the seasons, uh, end of the season with injuries and whatnot, kind of just showed that that we're all capable basketball players, and coach knows that, and that's that's kind of that's exactly why he recruited us because he knew we were good basketball players. Uh, but I think another reason he recruited us because he knew how good of people we were, and I feel like that's going to be a really important factor going into that because we know that like. It's his job to it's his job to put the best five guys out there at the time, whoever he thinks that is, and and we're understanding of that. And I feel like what's at the front of our minds most of the time, and and kind of how it was just throughout the season, is that we know that we're a unit and we're a team. So that's not necessarily something we're focused on. We're just focused on on how we can uh, be the best in our role uh, and whatever whatever coach believes that is. And then Bob, how do you think? Yeah, how do you think uh, Greg Brown will fit in? How how well do you know him by now? And how much have you got a chance to just watch him play? And, and how how do you think he'll mm -hmm. fit in with your team? Uh, I, I think Greg was a really big pickup for us. I feel like we were missing missing a guy like that who's just a really good energy guy, uh, really athletic, and can, can, can pretty much do it all. And I feel like he's really going to be a big piece for us next year. Uh, so that's definitely going to help us. Um, I don't really know him too well personally, but I, from from what I've seen, he's he's a really great guy, and I feel like that's a really important part as well. Jake <clears throat> Garcia, go ahead, please. Hey, Kavaka, sorry if you kind of already touched on this. My internet cut out there for a second, but going back to the EMT training, can you take us through on a day to day basis what that looks like and and the work you're putting in as it relates to that? Yeah, so basically, I'm right now. I'm kind of at the very basic level of it. So like, I'm actually waiting for the state's approval for them to start allowing those classes, which is actually starts on this upcoming Monday. So what the, what they're gonna end up doing? Uh, what, well, what what route I'm gonna end up taking is I'm gonna start at the most very basic level. So I'll start with CPR CPR training, which is a day class, and then I'll kind of then I'll get into ETT training. So basically, what that is what that stands for is an emergency trauma technician. So I'll do that training for about a week or so. And then once that's done, I'll probably end up going, instead of going direct straight into EMT, I'll probably do my fire training, uh, which is a, probably another week or two class. But what's difficult with that is that the state has certain mandates uh, put in place for the coronavirus. And they're very restrictive on the kinds of programs that they're allowed, that they're giving uh, uh, officials to be able to train right now. So I'm just kind of waiting uh, on information for that, but that's just kind of the process that I'm taking uh, towards that. And how rewarding do you envision this entire thing being, especially in the face of a pandemic where healthcare workers and, and people in the medical field are just so important to, to all of us right now? Um, how, do you, how do you think that's just going to be rewarding and kind of your experience? Uh, I, I definitely feel like, like it's, it's going to help me a lot just to grow, uh, as a person. Um, I feel like we spend as college athletes, we spend a lot of our time pretty much year round on focusing on our craft, which is very important. But I feel like now, uh, in these tough times that we're in, I feel like it's important to also grow outside of basketball. And I feel like this is just one way for me, for me to be able to do that. 
Dennis, go ahead, please. Uh, Kamaka, the, uh, you seem like you're in a really good spot, but, I mean, your shooting stroke's important to you. Do you have any anxiety, you know, that, man, I'm not getting my shot uh -huh. up enough? Uh, most definitely. And that's, that's kind of how I was feeling throughout the whole month of April, uh, which I would say it was kind of like that period of realization that we had to have, uh, just in general for how we're living now. Um, and it's definitely been tough and I've been talking to coach smart about it a lot. I, we have our meek, our weekly, uh, meetings, um, with him. So me and him have been talking about it a lot. Uh, but he told me like, continue to focus on the things that I can control and, because that's not one that I can control that I shouldn't put much, much effort or uh, thought into it. But obviously as a basketball player and as a person, we do that. And it's definitely taking a toll on me, but I also feel like I've been able to uh, expand my game, really just focusing on my body, uh, especially. So that's just kind of the way that I've been able to improve as a basketball player. Yeah, I kind of wanted to go there. I'm picturing Rocky IV in Russia coming up with creative <laughs> workouts. Do you have any Alaska kind of workouts? Uh, not really. Uh, one thing, one thing that's definitely uncommon for sure is like uh, we have these kind these hills that are kind of like a little bit outside of town um, that are covered in snow. So I'll spend some time out there doing conditioning work, just running in the snow uh trying to get in shape it's, it's very tough especially with the wind and the cold because like for a while uh it was very cold up here I want to say it was probably like negative 10 negative 14 every every day uh and I just had to find a way to you know what I'm saying just kind of push past that and and understand that I have to uh continue growing as a basketball player Travis go ahead please hey Kamaka I think you've kind of taken us through this before, but will you detail just the travel process of what it takes for you to get back to mm -hmm. your hometown? Yeah. Uh, so it, it typically takes a day, like a full day uh, and some. So basically how I, oops, how I get home uh, is I'll leave Austin around 2 p.m. Um, and I'll head to either Portland or Seattle. Um, then I'll have like a, which is about like a four hour, three and a half hour flight. Uh, then I'll spend like an hour or so there, however long the layover is. Um, and then I'll fly from Portland or to Seattle to the main city in Anchorage, which is about another three and a half, four hour flight. Um, and then typically I have to stay there overnight because I won't get in until it's around midnight over there um, because there's a, there's a three hour time change. Um, so I'll spend the night there, and then from there, I'll take a flight to Barrow, which is another two-hour flight. So that probably comes out to about, like, nine nine to ten hours of just travel time alone. And then also I was going to ask, you know, you mentioned um, your workouts. I'm sure you're keeping track of what your teammates are doing. How do you all hold each other accountable when you're all separated right now? Uh, it's it's definitely been tough, and you can't really say who's doing what. Uh, but I know that a lot of us are very hungry um, to to be better basketball players, and I feel like that's enough. And and we definitely trust each other enough to know that that we all want to get better. Um, but as far as holding each other accountable, I feel like the most important thing in in doing that is trusting each other and and knowing that all of us want to uh, be better. Chris Dukes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm mute myself. Oh, I'm on mute. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I was just going to, with with Greg coming in and, and all the players you guys have coming back, there's been a lot of, of hype already kind of building around around this next season. Is that something you guys are aware of, or are you kind of just trying to block it out? Uh, it's, it's definitely something that we not necessarily try to block out, but understand that a lot of that stuff is circumstantial. Um, and we try to focus on things that are more consistent. And I feel like just the experience that, that we've had uh, and our seniors have had, and now, now our sophomore are going to be sophomores, uh, is knowing that we're really the only, like our teammates and our coaching staff are really the only people that, that uh, are going to be down for us 100% the whole time. And I feel like that's going to help us kind of be able to block that out. Uh, but it's not – I wouldn't necessarily say it's something that we're focused on doing, but it's just something that we, we're going to naturally be able to do. Thanks. Any follow-up, Chris? Are you good? I'm good. Terry <clears throat> Middleton, I'm trying to unmute you. Go ahead, Terry. 
Kamaga, thank you for uh, being available. Appreciate it. So, um, you know, how much do you or how much are you allowed to interact with the UT coaches and, and what kind of feedback or input are they getting, uh, giving you there? Uh, I'm not sure like about the specific guidelines or whatever, but kind of how we've been going about it is we uh, typically have an entire team meeting uh, once a week. And then the coach or uh, coach smart gets with each of us uh, individually at, at least one time a week. And then we'll also do a positional positional meeting. Uh, so like we'll, we'll separate between the guards and the forwards. Um, and then we'll meet as a group. And, and a lot of that time is spent uh, as a team. I know it's spent kind of just discussing um, and catching up with each other because we're not really, we're not all together at the same time uh, too often. So that's kind of what we do then. Um, and then with coach smart for me personally, he's been, <clears throat> he's just been helping me uh, really grow, uh, tr helping me, giving me the tools to grow as a person. I feel like me and him have kind of been going through, uh, he's been sending me or he's been sending the team books and stuff. So I've just been trying to read those and just kind of go back and forth with him about it. Um, and then in those positional, positional meetings, we kind of just go over film and stuff and just focus on points that we want to emphasize in this upcoming season. Follow Terry. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Well, and do you envision a similar role next year or do you know of any changes in how the coaches plan to use you next year? Uh, no, that's not necessarily something we've discussed in depth uh, just because of the circumstances, but I feel like those things are going to play, play itself out how it should. And, and I definitely have a hundred percent trust in our coaching staff to figure all that stuff out. <clears throat> we'll go around show of hands. If anybody has a follow-up question. Brian Davis, you're up. Brian Davis, you're up. Kamaka, how tough is it to be a whaler? Uh, it's <laughs> that that is a that's a very good question, actually. It is it's pretty it's definitely very difficult. So I'll, I'll just kind of like run run you through the quick quick process of it. Um, so basically, yeah. how it works here is that there are uh, a number of whaling crews uh, that, that make up the whaling community. And basically what those crews are, are big groups of families. So that's how they kind of separate the crews. Um, and so each crew, uh, start, it starts with them breaking trail. That's what it's called, breaking trail. Uh, and what that consists of is they'll take their snow machines, their sleds, um, their tents and everything like that, all, all the uh, materials that they need. <clears throat> And then they'll go out onto the ocean. So the ocean uh, at the time or right now too is covered in ice. So like there's these big icebergs everywhere. It's, it's kind of uncharted territory at the time. And so that's what they're doing. They're breaking trail and kind of making this uh, trail from the shore all the way out to open water. So where the whales actually are. Uh, and once they get there, once they're breaking trail, which typically takes about 45 minutes to an hour uh, to get all the way out there to open water. Uh, and once they get there, they will set up camp. So it's called a whale camp. And basically what that is, is they set up their tents and stuff and they'll, they'll, uh, get all the materials ready to, uh, go out and actually go whaling. Um, and once they do that, they'll spend, I know some people who spend like a couple days out there, uh, before coming home. Like, obviously you can come home whenever, but I know a lot of the people who are very devoted to whaling spend a lot of time out there. Um, so they wait and, and what they do is they'll get onto this, uh, skin, seal skin boat. Uh, so it's, it's basically just a eight seat, eight seated boat. So like eight people will go onto the boat when they see a whale, they'll go out there, um, they'll harpoon the whale, uh, make sure it doesn't sink. And then once they do that, so once they've, uh, gotten the whale, they have to actually pull it out, pull it, uh, out of the water onto the ice by hand. So that's kind of, I would say that was, that's definitely the toughest part. Uh, but when we catch a whale, so when, when a whaling crew catches a whale, all of the whaling crews around it will go to that specific camp and they'll help like pull it up because you have to pull it up by hand. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm curious about is like, if this is the, if this is what everybody in the town does, were mm -hmm. you like, hell no, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna go be an EMT. I'm gonna go work on that. Uh, <laughs> Or, or was that even an option? Or were you like, hell no, hell no, I'm doing something different? No, nah, that's that's uh, that that's definitely not the attitude I had towards it because like that's just the culture that I grew up in. 
Um, and a lot yeah. of people take a lot of pride in it. And I definitely enjoy doing it and just being a part of it. But just because of the, uh, some factors of such as school and stuff like that, I haven't been able to get, get out there. Uh, but definitely when I had the chance to, I, I really want to go just because that's something I haven't done, like I said, uh, since before I moved out of Alaska. Cool. <clears throat> Nick, you're ready again, and then Dustin will finish this off. Nick, go ahead, please. Yeah, Kamaka, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you can't really formulate, I guess, a plan for when you can get back to Austin, when you're going to be able to get back in the city and be with the guys mm -hmm. again. I mean, do you have, I guess, any anxiety about there, you know, not being a season or maybe, you know, kids not being allowed back on campus in the fall? I mean, how are you, I guess, kind of trying to approach this, knowing that things can change day to day and it's all just very mm -hmm. uncertain right now? Uh, yeah, about that, like, I feel like the most important thing that, that our coaches and, and that we're kind of stressing is, like I said, just focusing on what we control. And I know that's very difficult and, and a lot uh, easier said than done. Um, and I definitely have thoughts about how just not even in regards to basketball, just in how life is going to continue uh, as we as we continue to go through this. Um, but I, I definitely do have thoughts about it. And, and I do get worried about it because I feel like it's something that that college athletes and college coaches are so uh, devoted to. And taking that away definitely hurts, but at the same time, like we have to understand that this is a very serious crisis, and and our health and and everybody's health should be the most important. Yeah, and I'm just curious. I mean, I mean, has the virus sort of touched your community at all? Do you know anybody that's been affected? They're or pretty isolated from that. Yeah, we we actually have zero confirmed cases, so that's good. Dustin, go ahead, please, to wrap us up. Yeah, Kamaka, I think it's been like, what, four or five years since you've spent this much time back home. You've obviously grown a lot as a person. What kind of perspective have you gained already in just the couple of months or so that you've been mm -hmm. back? And uh, a final one, what's more difficult, whaling or re rebounding in the Big 12? Uh, uh, so first, uh, wait, I'm sorry, I forgot what we, like, what was the first point that you made? Yeah, just like, it's been a while since you've been back, like four or mm -hmm. five years or so since you spent yep. this much time back home. What kind of perspective have you already gained now that mm -hmm. you've been there for about a month, almost two months that, you know, you've changed as a person, you've grown as a person, like, you know, going back home can kind of offer a little bit of clarity yeah. or different perspective about things. Yeah, most definitely. And I feel like that that's especially relevant here uh, just because of the discrepancy between Barrow and most cities in the United States. Uh, I have definitely have appreciated this time that I've been home. Uh, it's, it's definitely been very difficult because I feel like I've acclimated to the culture and the environments um, in Austin and just kind of like the continental U.S. in general. Uh, but it does give me a, a really good perspective on, on how important like certain things are. And I feel like one thing that's most glaring to me is just how, how important my family is to me. Um, and that's like just kind of the perspective that, that I've had on this whole thing, especially my grandparents and stuff. I feel like I've just been able to, to really spend time with them. And, and I feel like it's just, um, uh, increased my, my appreciation for, for certain aspects of just kind of my family really. Dustin, last thing. Yeah, and, and whaling or rebounding in the Big 12, which is my Oh, big I would have to say whaling is just because of uh, – Because the temperature or just is it, <laughs> the more physical work? It's definitely a combination of both, a combination of a lot of factors, actually. But I would say the process of, of catching a whale is a little bit more difficult.